Hello class, uh, Professor Mandeville back. This is lecture number 18 for History 101. And the theme of this lecture is going to be the Louisiana Purchase. So, uh, there's some background information as to how Thomas Jefferson ended up buying this land from France. And what happens is, first of all, in France, a new leader takes over, and that's uh, Napoleon Bonaparte. Now, Napoleon, obviously, as most of you know from studying European history, uh, has one thing in mind, being emperor of the world. So he's amassing this giant military and making France more and more powerful, and one thing that he has to deal with uh, right off the bat here uh, in, in the French Empire is that there's a rebellion in uh, one of the French holdings of Haiti. The Haitians rise up uh, and try to oust their French oppressors. Now, Napoleon is not about to give up on the French possession of Haiti, one of the few things they held after the French and Indian War. And also they have another pretty large, impressive holding. That's the Louisiana Territory. Now, previously, if you looked at maps before this time period, before Napoleon took over, and you'll remember with Pinckney's Treaty, uh, the Louisiana Territory was, was controlled by the Spanish. Spain will give it to the French when Napoleon takes over, sort of to try to appease Napoleon so that Napoleon doesn't attempt to attack Spain and take them over. Because remember, Spain's a declining superpower, and they certainly uh, know that Napoleon is up to no good. So they just give the Louisiana Territory to the French. So now they have it once again. So here's Napoleon's masterminded plan, or you might say plan A for taking over the world. He's building up this giant military, but now he's got trouble in Haiti. So he's going to send a large contingency of some of his very best troops to Haiti to squash the rebellion, which he believes won't take much at all, then those same troops will then venture north up into the Louisiana Territory and New Orleans, see what the French actually have gained from Spain, and also knowing that President Jefferson has substantially cut back on the Army and Navy to save money and balance the budget, he believes that the United States might be ripe for takeover and that his troops will be able to conquer the United States, use all the wealth gained from the conquering of America, and then use that towards his ultimate plan of conquering Europe and the rest of the world and becoming the emperor of the world. Now, I know it sounds crazy, but so was Napoleon. Now, uh, so, his troops go to Haiti. It's no cakewalk. The rebels are well prepared. They fight very hard against the French. And also, there's problems with malaria and yellow fever. It takes its toll on these French forces who ultimately subdue the rebels in Haiti. But it makes it so... Uh, Napoleon's going to have to have a change of plans. Now, in the meantime, uh, Napoleon basically has also notified the United States that no longer do they get the free use of the port of New Orleans, which they had gained in Pinckney's Treaty. He is going to start charging significant fees for American barges to unload their cargo there and then place them on ocean-going ships as they ship whiskey and other items to the East Coast. This is a big cost for our farmers and what Jefferson is even more fearful of, 
Napoleon will just shut off the entire port totally to American farmers for commerce, which will cripple our economy. So, while all this sideshow is going on in Haiti, which Jefferson really doesn't know the details of, because remember, we don't have modern news like today, he sends it, the Under Secretary of State, James Monroe, over to France on a mission to buy the Port of New Orleans from the French. By the time Monroe arrives there, the French have already experienced all these problems in Haiti, and Plan B is starting to go into effect. So, before Monroe really gets a chance to open his mouth and offer to buy New Orleans, the French diplomats say to him, how would you like to buy the Louisiana Territory? And they offer it to him for $15 million which is just slightly more than what he was authorized to spend on just the port of New Orleans by President Jefferson. So, uh, obviously, Under Secretary of State Monroe says, where do I sign? He signs this tentative agreement with the French, returns back to report to President Jefferson, and Jefferson can't believe it. He's delighted. The United States is going to be able to buy 827,000 square miles of territory for $15 million. Now, if you take a look on, at the map on page 222 in your text, you can see how gigantic the Louisiana Territory really is. This is quite a windfall for the United States. It will essentially double the size of our country with this one purchase. Plus, on top of it, it eliminates having Napoleon as a next-door neighbor, which is worth its weight in gold. Now, here's what Napoleon's up to. He believes he'll take this $15 million from the sale of Louisiana Territory, build up his military further, which will allow him to conquer Europe, then he'll come back to conquer North America after he's powerful from conquering Europe and parts of Asia. At least that's the game plan. Obviously, that won't work out for Napoleon, luckily, but that's what's going on in his convoluted mind. So, the next thing Jefferson has to do is get this purchase approved by Congress. And remember, from his Inauguration Day speech, he was President Cheapskate. He was saying, we're spending way too much money, we got too much debt, and all these other things. Now, all of a sudden, President Cheapskate wants to spend $15 million, which is a large sum of money back then. Now, he knows if he presents this to the Senate as a treaty, they'll never ratify it. There are enough Federalists in the Senate that they'll turn it down and it requires a two-thirds majority to ratify a treaty. So he decides it wasn't a treaty. He treats it as an executive agreement between him, the chief executive of the United States, and Napoleon, the chief executive of France. And since it's an executive agreement, all it requires is a simple piece of legislation with a majority vote appropriating $15 million to fulfill this executive agreement. He knows he has those votes. Pushes it through Congress, whether this is legal or constitutional or not. We'll never know. It was never challenged. And we buy Louisiana, which was a great thing for the United States. The next thing that Jefferson will do is he'll go to Congress and request $2,500. The $2,500 is what he needs to fund an expedition to explore what we just bought. Because basically, in 1803, when we bought Louisiana Territory, we really had no idea what was out there. Americans hadn't been there before. 
The only people that had really been out in this region were French fur traders from the past. So, he wants to have a group go explore it. Congress will okay the $2,500, which kind of shows you the value of money. That $2,500 is going to pay for almost a two-year exploration of the territory, obviously known as the Lewis and Clark Expedition, which at its time was the equivalent of putting a man on the moon. So, uh, once he's got the money, then he has to figure out, who am I going to get to lead up this? Who do I trust? If you take a look at the previous page, uh, 221, there's a portrait of one of the leader, the leader of the expedition, Meriwether Lewis. Meriwether Lewis was Thomas Jefferson's private secretary in the White House. He was highly trusted and a very close confidant of the president. He picks him because he has military experience and he trusts him unconditionally. Meriwether Lewis, when he's looking for a person to join him and be his right-hand man in the expedition, has no problem whatsoever. He picks his old commanding officer from his military days, Robert Clark, as his right-hand man. Thus, we have the Lewis and Clark Expedition, or as it's sometimes known as, the core of discovery. Now, they're going to put this group together uh, and recruit other explorers. They're going to have special a special boat built for them, which is essentially a gigantic, over 40-foot-long, specially made canoe to, uh, you know, for the expedition to use. It's such a large canoe-like ship that you can mount a small cannon on the bow of it. Now, after they're out recruiting people who knew something about the Louisiana Territory, one name keeps popping up of a person that you got to bring along because they know more about this region than anybody alive, and that's the French fur trader Toussaint Charbonneau. So, they find Charbonneau, they get him to agree to come with them, and he has one thing that he demands uh, of Lewis and Clark, or he will not go on the expedition. He demands that he must be able to bring with him his wife, an Indian woman by the name of Sacagawea. He's a French fur trader who's traveled extensively in this region, and he's married to Sacagawea, uh, an Indian woman. Lewis and Clark have second thoughts about this. They really hadn't considered bringing any women on this expedition, of all men. But it was vital enough to have Charbonneau accompany them that they reluctantly agreed. So, the fateful day comes when everybody's showing up in St. Louis uh, to where they depart from. And if you take a look at the map on 222, you can see the Lewis and Clark Expedition in 1804 leaves, departs from St. Louis up the Missouri River when Charbonneau and his wife arrive. And much to the chagrin of Lewis and Clark, not only is it Charbonneau and his wife, but they have an infant child also that he had failed to mention. So now they're kind of in a spot they're going to bring a woman and her baby on this expedition into the middle of unknown territory as far as they're concerned. But it's too late. Off they go. Now, if you take a look at the facing page, 223, there's uh, the medallion that has been made turned into a, a, a decorative piece by a Native American that Lewis and Clark were given by President Jefferson to present to Indian chiefs that they met in their travels. Because Jefferson's specific uh, 
instructions were they were supposed to explore this territory, figure out what was really there, try to see if there's a shortcut to the Pacific Ocean. A lot of people thought the Missouri River emptied in the Pacific, mistakenly, still looking for the elusive Northwest Passage. Uh, make friends with Native Americans along the way, tell them that they come in peace representing President Jefferson, and also make it a scientific discovery. Look at new animal species that they see along the way. Document them. Gather plant samples of new plants they'd never seen. Because Thomas Jefferson was a Renaissance man. We haven't talked about how he was a scientist, an agricultural genius, an architect, an educator. He's the one who founded the University of Virginia, designed most of the early buildings there. This, he was sort of the uh, next version of Benjamin Franklin. Now, so this is all part of Lewis and Clark's duties. They start paddling up the Missouri River and they're very surprised how Native American groups come down to the shores to greet them. Uh, they find out through Sacagawea, who speaks numerous Native American languages and immediately becomes their interpreter, that they're not uh, enthused or shocked to see white people in their territories for the first time, or maybe second time, or whatever. They're amazed by their giant custom-made boat. They've never seen a canoe that large that you could mount a cannon on the front of it. That's what they're running down to see. But regardless, Sacagawea communicates with these people, helps Lewis and Clark present them with these medallions in an offering of peace, Gifts are exchanged, and a lot of Native American items are brought back by Lewis and Clark and then later presented to Thomas Jefferson, and many of these items are housed in the White House or at the Monticello still to this day. Now, uh, they're going to make it as far north as uh, Montana to a place that isn't shown on the map, but it's in eastern Montana. It's a place called Fort Mandan. It's not a fort, it's a fur trading outpost. They winter over there, and then when spring comes, they continue to the west in Montana, following the Missouri River to its headwaters. Once they reach the headwaters, which is near present-day Helena, Montana, they can no longer paddle any further. So they hide their ship, and they venture out on foot. Now, Sacagawea has also proved her uh, usefulness on this expedition because she's an expert navigator, and she can navigate by the stars. And the longer this expedition goes on, the more obvious it is, the real important person who came along is Sacagawea. And Charbonneau is basically a worthless drunk. Sacagawea is an interpreter, a navigator, and really an integral part of the Lewis and Clark expedition. Now, they start venturing on foot, and they venture into Shoshone land. Now, the Shoshone Indians at this point in history have had nothing but problems with white explorers and settlers, especially the French, who were in their region for quite some time. And they've made a tribal decision that they don't want white people on their land and that what they're going to do in the future is if whites come venturing into Shoshone territory, they're going to kill them first and ask questions later. They want nothing to do with them. So here comes the Lewis and Clark expedition, and they enter into Shoshone land. A group of Shoshone warriors uh, approaches the Lewis and Clark expedition, ready for battle. But Sacagawea, with her child, goes to the front of the Lewis and Clark expedition and stops these warriors in their path. She can speak fluent Shoshone, and she tells them that they come in peace. 
They're stunned to see a woman with this expedition, the war Shoshone warriors, because typically no warrior groups ever have women with them. Plus, they're stunned by how fluent she is in the Shoshone language. She talks them into taking her and Lewis and Clark to meet their chief. So they do. They keep the rest of the Lewis and Clark expedition at bay, and they escort those three to the village. They do meet with the chief of the Shoshone, and the chief of the Shoshone is quite amazed by how fluently Sacagawea speaks the Shoshone language also. And they put two and two together and figure out she is actually a Shoshone Indian. She had always thought she was a Crow Indian, but as it turns out, she was abducted at a young age in a war between the Crow and Shoshone, who were mortal enemies, and taken captive. And as it turns out, she was the chief's sister. So instead of being these invading whites from the West, Lewis and Clark are heroes. They've returned an Indian princess to her tribe. So instead of being killed by the Shoshone, a feast ensues. And the Lewis and Clark expedition is treated like kings by the Shoshone. They're then guided to the next tribal lands, which are the Nez Perce Indians, who are very friendly with uh, white settlers, and they guide them to the Columbia River, furnish them with canoes, and the Lewis and Clark expedition in a fleet of Nez Perce canoes paddles to the mouth of the Columbia River, and that's where they spend the next winter on the Pacific Ocean. The next year, they turn around and go back, and you can see their path back. They kind of split up to explore more land, and then they ultimately return to St. Louis in 1806. When they report to President Jefferson, in their report, they talk about how for months they paddled through nothing but plains, grasslands, that's the Great Plains of the United States. To Thomas Jefferson, that immediately translated to him, that's potential farmland. You don't even have to clear the forest. This makes him thrilled with this purchase because remember in his inaugural address, he was worried we're running out of farmland. Now we've got more than we know what to do with potentially. They also bringing back articles from Indian chiefs, tell them about making it to the Pacific, bring back sample plant samples, even some bird samples they had preserved for the scientist Thomas Jefferson. And Jefferson is happy beyond belief. He can't believe how lucky America was to make that purchase double the size of the country, add all this potential farmland, and eliminate Napoleon as an unwanted next-door neighbor. That's why the Louisiana Purchase is the most important accomplishment of both terms of the Jefferson administration in the eyes of historians and Jefferson himself in his memoirs. Now, that's going to bring us up to the election of 1804. And remember, in this particular election, uh, Thomas Jefferson gets to pick a running mate. And because the uh, 12th Amendment has been added to the Constitution, and Thomas Jefferson obviously is not going to pick Aaron Burr as his running mate. He selects a brand new vice president, and that's going to be Governor George Clinton from the state of New York. He's still governor, and he's going to step down as governor and be Thomas Jefferson's running mate in 1804. Now, the Federalists in this particular election 
uh, are going to nominate Charles Pinckney as their candidate for the presidency. And in this elect, very lopsided election, because let's think about what Thomas Jefferson can run on. He's balanced the budget, eliminated most of the debt. He eliminated all internal taxes, including the dreaded whiskey tax, and doubled the size of, it, of the country in four years. Pretty solid record. So this is going to be one of the largest landslides in American political history. Thomas Jefferson will defeat Pinckney 162 electoral, electoral college votes to 14. But look at Jefferson's first term. Pretty amazing. So that's where I'm going to call it quits today. Uh, next time we'll pick up with Jefferson's second term and... Uh, which will lead us right into the War of 1812. So I'll see you soon. I'll be back here to the library to lecture in the near future. Take care. Have a good day. Be safe and stay home.